Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! Let's... I think everybody knows the story of the Beatles when they became famous. Close your eyes and I'll kiss you but little is known about the formative years of the Beatles when Pete was in, when they were the most exciting days, the Hamburg days. We were big headed little buggers from Liverpool, right? But, uh, you know, we were, we were fun. That was the main thing, but we were, we were proud of what we'd done as well. I was impressed with them, uh, mainly because they played their own music. Yeah, John and Paul had this thing of being a bit... bit if we're going to do this, we'll, we'll be professional songwriters. I said, I think we ought to sign them. Because I think there's more to come. So George Martin then said to me, hmm, all right, I'll think about it. The kids in Liverpool wanted to keep their Beatles. And they figured that if the Beatles got too big, they would be lost to, to Liverpool. And the Beatles would not come down to the Cavern Club anymore. <laughs> It was a lot of fun in those days. Obviously, <clears throat> we didn't know we were creating history then. We just went with the flow, which happened to be, I would say, the most creative years of the 60s were the happening of the Beatles. Beginning, the Beatles were a skiffle group. They sort of emerged from that particular era. And that was a time when sort of anything went. And it was a time when sort of people, the more sort of homegrown your sound, the better, which is why a lot of skiffle groups tended to use instruments made out of household implements. Later on, um, skiffle became very passe and the former skiffle groups tended to acquire it either fell by the wayside or they tended to acquire amplification and um, you know abandon their old sort of Lonnie Donegan repertoire and sort of concentrate more on sort of classic rock. And at the time that the Beatles were kind of smouldering into form, um, all the giants of classic rock seem to be um, going down, if you like. I mean, Elvis was in the army, Chuck Berry was in jail, Jerry Lee Lewis was disgraced for marrying his child bride, the Everly brothers were about to become Marines, Buddy Holly was dead, and it entered what I call the Bobby era, which was a kind of softened down version, almost a sanitised version of, of, of rock and roll. I mean, you know, Bobby Rydell, Bobby Vinton, Bobby V, all these Bobbies, very much, you know, boys next door, rather sort of insipid with a sort of half smiles and sort of lacquered hair. And, um, you know, the, the Beatles, although they did sort of make concessions towards this sort of music, the Beatles were essentially sort of rockers through and through. The girls used to, you know, scroll on the wall about the private parts of Beatles and whatever, or any other groups. Uh, I had to get the toilets redecorated. And in those days, uh, two guys that used to hang around as coffee bar layabouts was John Lennon and Stuart Sutcliffe. There were five Beatles in my days. And knowing they were from the art school, I said, I've got a job for you, lads. And they said, uh, yeah, what, Alan? I said, will you uh, decorate the ladies' toilets? Which they did. So the first money that ever changed hands between me and the Beatles was decking, decorating the ladies' toilet. Actually, when they finished, I preferred the graffiti. But in those days, they used to hang about route as coffee bar layabouts. I can still see now Paul, John, and John was having toast, and he wanted jam on the toast. And Paul telling Moff said, John, you must be mad. It's a penny extra. Now look at Paul, yeah? We need about a penny extra for jam on the toast. I wish he'd pay some of the jam he owed me. I put on uh, a big pop concert in what was then the boxing stadium. It's now demolished. And I'd seen a show with Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent uh, at the Empire Theatre. And I booked the entire show. But unfortunately, Eddie Cochran was killed in a tragic uh, car accident two weeks before the concert. I said, the bloody bastard, you know, he's let me down here, badly. And then I phoned up Larry Pons, who was the entrepreneur, 
And I said, is the show cancelled? He said, well, you can cancel it, of course, but Gene Vincent is willing to do it. I said, okay, we'll go ahead. So then my problem was, how do I make up for the loss of Gene Vincent? Then I got this brainwave. There were so many groups that used to hang out the jacaranda. I thought, I'll put them on for the first half of the show. Rory Storm and Hurricanes, Jerry and the Pacemakers. And so uh, I put the show on with Liverpool groups, which was a big success. And then when we went back to the jacaranda after the show, uh, Pons was so impressed with my groups. Well, they weren't my groups, I'd just booked them for the show. And he said, can I use them to back my artists, like maybe, say, Tommy Steele or something like that in Scotland? I said, yeah, sure. And so next day, I go to the Jacker and I'm approached, I think, by Stuart and John, because they were at the art school, which was three minutes away from the Jacaranda. And they used to uh, miss the lessons sometimes and come to the Jack to listen to the groups rehearse because it wasn't used in the daytime, the basement. So I let the groups rehearse. And I think it was Stu came up to me and said, Hey, Al, when are you going to do something for us? Like, and I thought, so. Well, there's no more decorating to be done, that's it. He said, no, we've got a group. We were at your show last night. And uh, would you like to manage us? And I said, well, who are you? He said, the Beatles. So it's a strange name. They were rather a clumsy group before they went to Hamburg. Um, I mean, it, it, the group boiled down essentially to, to John Paul and George and with various drummers they didn't sort of have any sort of drummer that they seemed to be able to hold on to for very long um, they had a bass player they managed to get one of um, uh, John's old John's colleagues at art college to buy a bass he, I mean he wasn't a particularly good bass player Stuart Sutcliffe and uh, you know but I mean essentially he was there just to sort of make up numbers although they did have rather a surfeit of guitarists and uh, as a result you know Paul tended to play the piano whenever there was one available and he also was actually quite a good drummer and he also with very bad grace he used to fill in on drums whenever the, you know either the drummer didn't turn up or they simply didn't have a drummer um, they were offered a you know a season in Hamburg clubland, providing they could find somebody to sort of sit behind the kit. And um, it happened that, that Pete Best was available, that he was reasonably competent, and he actually owned a drum kit. And so, you know, after the most cursory audition, he was in. I was fortunate, I think, um, because I got to know them on a social level, you know, before I actually joined them in 1960. And I think it was one of those, um, you know, the more you actually mixed with them, um, you appreciated their humour. Um, knocked out by John the first time I saw him, just loved the way he looked, you know, the, um, his image, the way he handled himself, the little quips he had, his, you know, quirky sense of humour, um, you know, that was doubled up in stitches, you know, before he'd even come into the club. Paul was very much the PR guy, you know, he was the uh, prim and proper, what's the deal moaning, this type of thing. George was a little bit like a, well he was the youngest in the you know, quartet anyway, um, so he was like, I won't say now to say the baby, but he was the junior member, you know, and everyone, even though he brought them down, once it, George sort of got into their company, they took over the, you know, the, uh, the, the mantle. And uh, I just found they were dead easy to get on with, right? And of course, with them playing here, socialising here, mixing upstairs in the kitchen, coming to the famous Casbah parties that used to take place upstairs, I got to know them. And of course, when I actually auditioned for them, the offer came up to go to Germany in 1960. It wasn't like auditioning for a new band. It was like auditioning for a gang of mates. You know, we were all playing the same music. We'd all done the same thing. We'd all played the same clubs. You know, it was just the fact that they were one of the first bands to go out to Germany and they asked me. And that's how I joined them. We knew we were going to play Hamburg. We were excited about the fact because we were most probably the second band from Liverpool to go into Hamburg. Derry and the Seniors being the first one out there. And uh, Alan was responsible for it. 
uh, and taken us out and as he always turned around and said he smuggled us into Hamburg the first time. We didn't know we had to have papers and work permits and all that type of thing. It was just very much a case of your students, you know, leave it up to me and we'll get in there. But excitement in the van simply because of the fact uh, we didn't know what Hamburg was going to be like. You know, we knew it was a port, Liverpool was a port. But when we actually got there and we hit the Reaper Bar, right, that was absolutely incredible. You know, I mean, we got to imagine we were what 17, 18 year olds. And we had this maze of neon lights which just stretched the whole, whatever the Reaper Barn's length is, a mile and a half or something like that. It made Blackpool Illuminations look, you know, like a little fairy town. It was heaving. You know, the crowd was out, the atmosphere was out. And of course, we suddenly realised that this was San Pauli. You know, this was the, the red light district of the world. And the more we got to know it, you know, and we found out where we were playing and the hours that we had to play, it became a second home to us. You know, San Pauli, even though it was the red light district of the world, it was our playground. And that's what we loved about the place. Playing in the grotty old Indra, you know, down at the bottom end of the uh, the Grosser Fry height, and we, you know, the challenge was you've got to turn this into a second Kaiser Gallery, which we did, and then we got it shut down because we were playing too loud, you know. But, uh, that's another story, so to speak. But I suppose when we got there um, and we said, where are we playing, and how long are we playing, and we were told you're playing seven hours a night, you know, uh, 15 minutes off every hour. It was a hell of a challenge because no one from Liverpool had played those hours before. And I was like, okay, um, that is a bit of a challenge. How do we do it? Right? So we built ourselves up. You know, we adjusted to it. Uh, you know, as the crowds built up, um, there'd be certain periods during the, the sets when we wouldn't have to be as frantic and, you know, energetic as, you know, we would be when it was a full house. So we used to pace ourselves. And, uh, you know, we'd add solos into numbers to make them last longer. So, you know, you might get a, on a hot night, you know, when the crowd's packed, you might get a, you know, version of what they say, which would last for about 15 minutes. But the crowd loved it, you know. And as long as the crowd was up and yelling for more, we were up for more, you know. If the crowd emptied a little bit, we'd take it down a step. We became very professional. We grew up there. <laughs> What we were doing at that time uh, was basically covers, which ranged from Little Riches to Chuck Berry, the Everly Brothers, you know, right? We were fortunate in as much that, you know, with the scale of voices we had, you know, I mean, they were very good, you know, harmony-wise. They had so much time in Hamburg that they were writing their own music. That's why they were able to produce so many. They'd already done it in Hamburg. There was another club called the Top Ten. They were playing in the Kaiser Keller. Now, in the Top Ten, there was a fantastic musician playing there called Tony Sheridan. Now, in the intervals, they used to go round to the Top Ten to listen to Tony Sheridan. In fact, they owe a lot to Tony Sheridan, their music abilities. They learned a big deal from Tony Sheridan. And then Koshmi there had a bit of a spy called Herr Steiner, and he used to report to Koshmi there that the lads had done a deal that when they come back to, when they come back to Hamburg, they were gonna play at the top 10 club. So he invented a story that they tried to set fire to the um, living quarters, which obviously was an old variety theater. And what were the dressing rooms was their living accommodation. They had no water whatsoever. I don't think it had been cleaned for about 20 years. And when they were messing about, getting ready to go home, uh, I think Paul lit a condom which scorched the wall because the, the, the dust was about half an inch thick, so it just left a, left a black mark on the wall. And so he reported them to the police when the police came round, they had no work permits, which Koshim there had promised to get, which he didn't. And he took very great measures to ensure that they would never work in Hamburg again. He discovered that George Harrison was actually a miner at the time and shouldn't be working 
in a red light district after midnight, which he had been doing. And so he arranged for George to be deported. We'd done four months there, should have been a month. We were kicked out on the way back. We came back reformed. The lifeline was thrown here, the Casbah, the um, 19th of December. This is where Beatlemania started, with the Casbah. Okay. Regardless of what other people turn around and say, some people turn around and say it was Little and Town Hall on uh, the 27th, it wasn't. Mo gave them a lifeline and they, the first gig they did in Liverpool on the return back from Hamburg was here. It, it seemed funny actually because it always ended up the first gig we came back from Hamburg and the last gig before we went to Hamburg was always the Casbah. It wasn't planned that way but when you look back in hindsight it happened. But uh, that particular night, the, the first night the Beatles played here, the reaction from the Liverpool audiences, you couldn't move in here. Right? There were kids squashed on the ceilings. Health and safety didn't exist, right? <laughs> as far as we were concerned then. And the word went out on the street. And, you know, the next time they played in Liverpool, it was just, <laughs> gotta go and see the Beatles. You know, the word was out. We'd, we'd taken Liverpool by storm. So, of course, consequently, as a result of that, you know, uh, conquering Hamburg on the first trip out, coming back because we'd been virtually unknown before we went out, but then came back and delivered this powerhouse show so that basically every promoter in Liverpool was screaming out for us. I think when we started to establish ourselves in Liverpool and on the second trip back to Germany, that's when we started to experiment a little bit. It was like, okay, let's throw a couple of songs which we've written ourselves. And because we've set the pattern, because when we came back to Liverpool, a lot of bands, the image we had, and the type of music we were playing, the style of it, the savageness of it, the power of it, just basically blew people away. Audiences had never seen it before. But here we were, you know, five lads from Liverpool delivering it, you know, on your doorstep. And a lot of bands in Liverpool changed overnight, consequently, as a result of that. You know, they'd been very lightweight before that. Uh, a little bit like Cliff Richard in the Shadows, dressed in sparkly suits, very clean cut. Um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, leather jackets were... Everyone had a leather jacket that was a muse on Liverpool. And the image changed. So consequently, as a lot of the bands followed suit with the Beatles, um, and the image changed and the type of material they were playing became very heavy and frenetic basically what the Mersey Beat sound is today, what it's recognised for. Um, to be one step ahead of them, and it was always one upmanship, right? We turned around and said, because a lot of people, they may have been writing songs, but they didn't have the courage to perform them on stage. That was the big thing. And it was like when, a little bit like one upmanship where you turn around and say, and here's a song which we've written ourselves, and we're going to play it. And you can see there's a, atmosphere in the audience is like, hang on a minute, what's this going to be like? We're fortunate we had great songwriters, Lennon and McCartney, right? So even their early stuff, which is world famous now, you know, when we started doing the likes of, uh, you know, Like Dreamers Do and Love of the Loved, they went down fantastic with the audiences. They loved them, you know, and of course that was, Beatles are writing their own material. Everyone started writing in Liverpool. It was harder to get them back the second time because of the deportment order. But this time, instead of being smuggled in as students, they went in as musicians. I had to sign an affidavit to say I would be responsible for any misbehaviour. And also the guy at the top ten, Peter Eckhorn, he had to sign a similar thing. So if they made any bad mistakes or robbed or anything wrong, I would be responsible, or Peter Eckholm would be responsible. You know, when we went back to Hamburg, it was a different club. Uh, it was the top ten club, which was the best club in town at that present moment. You know, the audience was a little bit more upbeat. Even though, you know, the crowd from the Kaiser Keller is still playing, because that was the only place they could see the Beatles. So Peter Eckholm, who owned the top ten, was very much, you know, rubbing his hands because the Kaiser Keller was, you know, which was his rival, round the corner, 
um, was paling into insignificance. He had Sheridan, right? Tony Sheridan was the house musician. He had the Beatles, and they were the two biggest names in Hamburg. And he had them under one roof, playing on the same stage. And his, his club was packed every night. So with that atmosphere and that infamy that we had, you know, we were riding high. You know, we were, we were big-headed little buggers from Liverpool, right? But, uh, you know, we were, we were fun. That was the main thing, but we were, we were proud of what we'd done as well. We, we needed to go back. Um, and I think the reason for it was what was happening in Liverpool, it was dance halls, and we felt that the opportunity we had in Hamburg, right, playing in a club as a residential band, was something which wasn't going on in Liverpool. Right, we were playing great, we were playing seven nights a week. You know, a lot of other bands are only playing once or twice a week. But going back there and playing under one roof and being in the public eye all the time. And, you know, because uh, Hamburg was a fast becoming a music city, you know. So there's, as well as Liverpool, a lot of people in, in Hamburg, you know, as regards the record industry and the fact that the bands were from Liverpool, were starting to take an interest in you know what we would call English music or English artists that were appearing over there so it seemed sense to go back and as it so happened you know second trip back Bird Kempford signed us up which was great for us we were at the top 10 for about three months um, and round about middle of May, end of May, we were told by Peter Reckhorn um, that Bird Kempford, who was the biggest A&R man in Germany at that time, uh, with Polydor Records, uh, was interested. People had seen the band, fed it back to him, and he was interested in seeing it for himself. And he came down and watched us a couple of times, but we always got the tip off from the manager of the club when he was in the audience. So, you know, it was like Bird Kempford's in the audience, da 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 and away we'd go. Um, I'll do some of the choice numbers, you know, to impress him. But he was impressed with the band anyway. Um, he liked the harmonies, he liked Sheridan, he liked the combination of the, you know, the two together. And the fact that he could record Tony by himself and the Beatles by themselves. So, uh, one particular night, at the end of the night, he turned around and called us over. And in a nutshell, basically turned around and said, you know, love to record you. You know, love to sign you up. We'll set a date, you know, where you're going to record in Germany. Uh, for the Polydor label, and uh, that date was set, you know, for uh, sometime in June, you know, just before we left. And of course, it, over those two days, two or three days that we were there, uh, my Bonnie came to fruition and Cry for a Shadow and Ain't She Sweet, which are household names now in the music industry. I was still struggling, and then Brian Epstein uh, came onto the scene. And he was sort of bored, failed uh, amateur actor, and he was looking for something like the Beatles, and, and he did a good job with him. I've never knocked Brian Epstein. He was like the fifth Beatle, because uh, the fifth Beatle who was um, Stuart Sutcliffe stayed on because he'd fallen in love with a girl called Astrid Kirchner, who was a photographer. So he left the group, and Brian, although he couldn't play, became the fifth Beatle, and he worshipped them. We, we just rose from strength to strength, and consequently as a result of that, um, you know, a certain fella called Brian Epstein, right, uh, started to take interest um, with people going into the shops and the famous Brian Jones story, which is actually true. A lot of people think that that's, you know, a made up story. There was a Brian Jones and he did ask for, you know, my body. And uh, as we all know now, Brian, he said it was by the Beatles. And it wasn't, as Brian found out, it was Tony Sheridan and the Beat Brothers, you know, what we alluded to before. But uh, he turned around and said uh, to Brian, you gotta go and see them. You know, they're playing at the cabin down the road. You gotta go there, mister, and go and watch them. They're the best band you can see in your life. And uh, I think Brian had read about us in the Mersey Beat as well. We'd always been in NEMS you know, making a nuisance of ourselves because the minute we walk into NEMS, <laughs> listen to the, the records, you know, the booths they used to have in those days, shop would come to a 
standstill virtually you know the girls behind the counter would be oh god it's the Beatles you know do you want to listen to the new releases and they were like yeah okay and uh, you know there'd be mayhem going on to be quite honest and um, you know he must have known who we were and you know with the, the advent curiosity got the better of him you know who the hell are the Beatles I've got to go and see them you know story goes he went down to the cabin Stood in the shadows, watched the Beatles, fell in love with them. The next thing we knew was a message passed down to us. And uh, Brian wanted to sign us up and become manager, which is what he did eventually, a recording artist. Right, that was a big word on the grapevine because uh, one of the first bands to be signed up in Liverpool. Okay, it didn't matter whether it was a German label, it was the biggest German label. Right? And of course, uh, it was great for the posters and the publicity and everything else. And, you know, the crowd, which, which was great, um, you know, they were, they wanted us back. We'd been away three months, you know, and their, their favourite band, or one of the favourite bands, you know, was coming back home again. They were going to be playing the local scenes, they were going to be playing the Casbah, they were going to be playing the Cavern, you know, the local haunts. They were back in the vicinity again, you know, the kids in Liverpool could see them, not just hear about them. In terms of what Brian did, is, uh, he, he made them acceptable as best he could. They were still little rogues in, in the real life. Um, they looked smart and presentable. They didn't swear on stage anymore, didn't smoke on stage anymore. Um, and he was the only person that, at the time, could have turned them into what they were. He was the only person with that perseverance. You know, that anyone else that had managed or uh, been involved with them had just given up, or they, they didn't have any, the, the ambition to crack them out of that. And they'd be like Brian, the Beatles might never have cracked out of Liverpool. Because you know, they, they, other proper managers, you say, like Larry Pons and... Uh, uh, who managed, you know, Billy the Billy Furies and the, the, those people. They'd all seen the Beatles and just paid no attention to them, just sort of, you know, they hadn't collared what they were all about. Uh, Brian was the one who actually saw the, that possibility that they could make a record, that they could play further south than Leicester, you know, they could... I mean, it wasn't long before he was saying, you know, they'd, they'd be bigger than Elvis, and people... <laughs> you know. And, of course, they did become bigger than Elvis. His management style was a bit bizarre, because he, he'd never been a manager. No, was, no, was, he, as soon as he took them under his uh, wing, it wasn't. It was only six months before they got a record contract, and he, as soon as he took them over, he, he doubled and tripled the amount of money that they were earning at gigs. You know, the promoters and management people before, we just thought they'd just pay them a five or a quid each. You know, and that'll do them for the night. Brian immediately insisted that he got a fair whack of what was taken at the ticket office. Places. So they were suddenly earning fifteen pounds an hour. Before Love Me Do came out, they, you know, they were earning fifty quid a week each, more, which was a damn lot of money for a gang of scallywags. What we wanted was an English recording contract. That was the big thing. We had this recording contract in Germany because of the sheer economics of it, having to go over there record. We felt, now hang on a minute, does it, you know? Recording companies in England, Decca, EMI, you know, you name it, Decca being the biggest. Let's try and get a deal with them. And that was the mission which, you know, we gave Brian. We turned around and said we want an English, re you know, com recording contract. And he did. Um, he went to the, because of his contacts with him, you know, the record industry, he went to the biggest record company that was going at that time, Decca, right? Um, bent the area, got Mike Smith, you know, dear old Mike. Uh, to come down and watch the Beatles at the cabin, and Mike was absolutely knocked out with them, you know. And hence that, you know, famous or infamous Decca audition, Jan one, nineteen sixty-two. You know, but uh, that was the that was the speed he was moving at, right? Because he'd only been a manager 
on paper for a couple of months. You know, so to land an audition within a couple of months with the biggest record company in England, right, as well as grooming us and polishing us, um, you know, he was setting a fine example to us. So there was nothing that we could turn around and say, hang on a minute, this guy's not doing anything for us. He was, you know, he was, he was flying. Arne Epstein wrote to me at the Liverpool Echo uh, under my nom de plume that I had written under and to his surprise got a letter back from somebody named Tony Barrow in, in, in London and um, he came to see me and he um, at Decca and he brought with him um, an acetate, a demo disc that he said um, had been made by a television company who were making a documentary about the Beatles at the Cavern Club and he said that this um, acetate had been taken from their um, soundtrack and that's why it was poor quality. It was only many years later that I discovered that this was a little white lie because what he'd actually done and why it was poor quality is that he had stood in the middle of the cavern with a very old, um, what today would be an antique um, Philips cassette tape recorder and held a, a mic in the air and got the sound from around him. Well, the sound of the Cavern Club that he had captured was great. Uh, you could get the sort of electrifying feeling, the ambience of, of, of this place, the excitement of it, um, but you certainly couldn't really tell very much about his band. You couldn't tell what the Beatles were like as such. Uh, and I kind of um, did a don't call us, we'll call you thing on him um, at Decca, but it wasn't my place to do that. I mean, I wasn't there to hire or fire the talent. I was there to write these liner notes, sleeve notes for the, the albums. Um, but I really didn't see that what he'd got there was anything special from what he had played to me. But when he left Decca, I had picked up the internal phone and rang not the production department, not the producers, not the artists people at all, but the marketing department at Decca on the internal phone uh, because I, I knew that Brian Epstein had uh, record shops uh, in Liverpool. And at first the the people in the marketing department sort of said, no, Epstein, Epstein, no, don't know that name. Is that the name of the shops? And I said, no, the shops are called NEMS, North End Music Stores. Immediately, the marketing department sprang to attention and saluted and said, NEMS, one of our greatest customers in the northwest of England, this band has to have an audition. And it was through me and a number of other people. I mean, he obviously sort of pushed the local sales reps and everybody else that he could, um, wh whose ears he could get the attention of. Uh, so several different sources were all sort of saying to Decca, audition the Beatles. All this led to what became a disastrous New Year's Day uh, audition. Uh, the, the following on, on uh, New Year's Day, in fact, in 1962. As Brian went to great bones to tell us about before we went down there. You know, you must go to bed early and of course at past two in the morning we're in the middle of Trafalgar Square doing certain things which we shouldn't be doing <laughs> and got to the session hungover. Uh, but yeah, I mean it was it was New Year's Day. The excitement was there and we played about 14 or 15 numbers. Um, not our choice. I mean that if there's one thing which I'd turn around and say about Brian was the choice of material he made us play on that particular day. Didn't do us any justice. Um, I can see that the, the wisdom in it um, was that he, he wanted to show Decker the cross section of material we, we could do from out and out rockers to grey harmonies to country and western to original material. Um, but as Mike Smith turned around and said, what he actually saw in the cabin didn't come over studio wise. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we never got to get with, uh, with Decker. But the, the sting in the tail here is that the myth down the years has always been that every other rec major record company in London turned the Beatles down. What they actually turned down was not the Beatles, but that same Decker audition tape, because that's all Brian Epstein had to hawk around the other record companies, and he was taking this around um, with him, and of course they were turning it down because it wasn't a very good audition. I mean, I, it was a long time afterwards that I heard the Decker audition uh, tracks, and I must confess that if I had been listening to them as a producer, I don't think I would have contracted the Beatles. We thought that we had Decker's contract in the back. You know, final words from Mike Smith were, don't worry lads, we even went out and celebrated, you know, St. John's Wood, 
big lavish dinner on Brian, of course. But uh, you know, the wine was flowing, etc., etc. We all came back in high spirits, and then a couple of weeks afterwards, we were turned around and told, you know, on a bummer, Tech had turned you down. They signed Mike Poole and the Tremolos. So that, to us, was like red rag to a bull. Um, and I was okay, Brian, coin and expression, get it back on your bike again, and you know, give us a contract. And as we know now, um, Decker being the biggest company, he, he took the tapes from Decker and he hooked them around London, all the record companies. He wasn't getting on. They weren't, they weren't biting. Um, till someone heard them and cut a long story short because it's well chronicled, um, it, it caught the ear or gave someone the interest to actually bring it to George Martin. I was sitting at the, uh, the, the console waiting for, for them to arrive. The door opened and in walked George Martin himself. And I thought, oh, this is going to be some sort of special artist test. It was the first time that the main producer has ever arrived. Anyway, one long before the door opened the studio and in walked these four guys. Of course, I, it was a double take when I looked at their hairstyling, etc., you know. Never seen anything quite like that, all looking exactly the same hairstyle wise. So, in number two, the, the control room is above the studio, and you have to go down steps to, to, the, to the actual studio. So, I went down and, and introduced myself, and they in turn introduced themselves, and you know, John, Paul, George, Pete, as it was then, Pete Best. And by them, their accent then, I picked up, ah, he's a Liverpudlian. And I had a soft spot for Liverpudlian humour. They started to sing and perform their numbers. I think the first one was uh, Besame Mujo, an old movie song, I think it was. And um, they had no, in no indication at all that uh, their, of their forthcoming songwriting ability. Didn't have any, any indication of that. So anyway, it, it wasn't very, very impressive at all. But I liked them. I, I, you know, their, 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 bits of their humour were coming out, particularly John uh, and Paul. And uh, George, well, he, he was a bit of an introvert anyway, George. So anyway, I, you know, they weren't impressive at all. So George said, well, I think we'd better bring George Martin, we'd better bring them up. So we did, we brought them up. And then George Martin started to address them to say what he was looking for and what they got to do. We were looking for certain songs and, you know, and the way they treat it and head arrangements and all that kind of thing. Then he handed, uh, handed them over to me and I they went on about the equipment, you know, and I suggested certain equipment that they got to get, uh, including Pete Best's cymbals, you know, all that sort of thing. And uh, anyway, went on for about 20 minutes, this, this dressing them down, sermonising. And then at the end, George Martin said to them, he said, uh, well, look, we, you know, we've been having a go at you for some time. Is there anything you want to say to us? They just stood there, like silence, nothing. And they were looking George up and down, looking me up and down. Nothing at all. Then all of a sudden, it was George Harrison looking at George Martin. He said, yeah, I don't like your tie, he said. And, you know, to me, I just, I nearly fell off my chair laughing. <laughs> Tears were running down my face. And, and then some, some more humour came out, you know. And anyway, they eventually they left the control room, left George and I there. I was wiping the tears away from my face and George said to me, well, what do you think? So I said, well, I, I said, I've never seen anything. I've, I've tested quite a number of these guitar groups. I've never seen anything like these guys. I know what we've heard today <clears throat> uh, is, you know, pretty rubbishy. I said, but I think we ought to sign them because I think there's more to come. So George Martin then said to me, hmm, all right, 
I'll think about it. And on the results of that, um, we got signed up and the recording date was set for 6th of June 1962, which was just after we'd come back from Hamburg for the third time, right? Because uh, we'd opened the Star Club. And of course, congratulations while we were away because, you know, Bird Kempford had released us from our Polydor contract. And we can now turn around and say, we were EMI recording cars, which is a big company in England. And by now, Brian had got us onto BBC, you know, Teenagers Town, uh, Manchester Playhouse, so we were broadcasting stars as well, you know, so it was like, you know, the only thing that we hadn't conquered yet was TV, but that was to come, but not during my stay with them anyway. But uh, yeah, 6th of June, um, we were adamant about the fact that we wanted to record our own material. Love Me doing P.S. I Love You, we'd practice on the German crowds, the Star Club, Changed the format, the, the arrangement several times till we were quite happy with it. And uh, even though George Martin wanted us to record other people's material, we were adamant about the fact that no, you know, we write our own material and we're going to record our own material. And we were quite dogmatic about it actually. And if it was anyone else's material, we wouldn't pay too much attention to it. We'd do a cack handed version of it right, to make sure that our <laughs> material was stronger. And uh, Hence, love me doing P.S. I love you. They were the ones that, you know, the, the, f the first ones that we wanted to record. The first re proper session came along, still with Pete Best drumming, and that was um, Love Me Do, started that. But this time, George Martin's assistant turned up to do it. No George Martin. So it was Ron Richards that uh, turned up and was left to Ron and myself to, to produce Love Me Do. It didn't turn out to be too good, I'm afraid, uh, mainly because uh, what I think it was uh, the head arrangement of Love Me Do, because uh, all, the, all their stuff was head arrangement. They, they didn't read music, it was all head arrangements that happened. And um, anyway, Ron then postponed the the uh, session then and it was two or three weeks later i think when they came in again but before that ron had reported back to george george martin saying that he thought pete best had got to go that he thought his drumming wasn't good enough we played the cabin the night before and it was very much a case of um brian came up and just hit, again the usual thing you know with handling the business side before there'd been business meetings <coughs> and it was very much a case, Pete, I want to see you in the office in the morning. And I thought, yeah, okay, it's another, you know, chew the fat one, talk about promoters, should we put the price up, what's this venue like? Usual stuff you talked about. And I, I said, okay. Yeah, so I said, yeah, get there about half ten. So I said, yeah, that's fine. Jumped in the van with Neil, came home, he dropped me off the next morning at NEMS. He turned around and said, I'll wait for you, Pete. So I said, yeah, you know, only be a couple of minutes. And uh, went in and I could tell that Brian was very aggravated and anxious. And he talked around the subject for a while and then he just turned around and said, Pete, he said, I don't really know how to turn around and tell you this. Uh, he said, the boys want you out and it's already been arranged. And I think that was the key word, already been arranged, that Ringo would join the band on Saturday. And this was either Wednesday or Thursday. So when you you walk in Copper Hoop, um, not expecting anything because there'd be no forewarning or, you know, we're not happy with you in the band or anything like this. Uh, when you, you're confronted with that, to be quite honest, your brain was scrambled, right? And I was standing there gasping for air, you know, trying to get my brain to work. And I just basically turned around and said, you know, well, what's the reason for it? And the reason it was given at the dismissal was uh, I wasn't a good enough drummer. They felt Ringo was better. And I've always disputed that. Um, a lot of people have seen me play then and since I've always turned around and said it's a matter of choice, you know. Um, but at that time I was reputed to be one of the best drummers in Liverpool. So it didn't hold up water, didn't make sense, but at that present moment in time, you know, even if you just said anything else, it still wouldn't have made sense. And it was just, okay, can't get your brain thinking. If that's the way they want it, I'm off. 
And he asked me to play two gigs with them till Ringo sat in. And I, I suppose you could turn around and say, brain wise, being brain dead, I agreed to do it. And it was only when I got back home again and turned around, I said, hang on a minute, I can't play two gigs with these guys who just kicked me out. Um, but Brian had covered himself on that because he had Johnny Hutch playing on the same bill. So when I didn't show up, Johnny Hutch stood in for me. Um, but it was only when I got back home again that the, you know, the true force of the dismissal hit me. You know, when I walked out again, Neil was in the van and he went, what's happened? And I went, I've been kicked out. And he just went, I don't believe it. And we didn't say anything until we got back home again. The very beginning, I asked John um, what the situation was with Pete Best. And John said, Pete Best is a great drummer Ringo Starr is a great Beatle, and that was something that meant a great deal to me. I knew exactly what he meant, although I was only just getting to know the Beatles at the time. That is the point. Uh, Pete Best was fine as a musician, no problems, but somehow he wasn't a Beatle, whereas uh, Ringo Starr fell very naturally into the role of one of the Fab Four. Pete was a, a good, a great, noisy, loud, thumping drummer. But he, he was never like with the other three. I mean, if you saw the other, if you saw them out at night after a gig so, uh, at, at the Blue Angel or one of the late nights, drinking spots. Pete was never with them. He'd always gone home with the equipment and his girlfriend, uh, Kathy. And the other three would be falling around in, in low dives. And Ringo was always in those places as well, and joining in as with a very similar uh, way of life and a sense of humour. So really, quite apart from um, his talent, which was undoubted, Pete Best was, was okay. In, he looked good and he sounded good on stage with the Beatles. There has been talk that there was a bit of jealousy on Paul's part, that maybe Pete Best looked too good on stage um, for the good of the rest of the band and Paul in particular. Um, but I, I, I don't know whether that played any part. You would have, have to ask other people that one. But um, it was not for... It was not because he was untalented. John may have been right, maybe it was that Pete Best just wasn't a Beatle, didn't fit into the, the gang of four like that. Um, but I do believe, um, although Pete Best does deny it, has denied it personally to me, I do believe that the whole business of Brian Epstein and Mona Best and the possible problems that there would have been in, uh, in the management side of things um, did play their part in Pete having to be dropped from the band at that time to his personal absolute utter devastation, desolation. What, how he was playing, it was what he was playing that was all wrong in my view because I was very used to head arrangements because I had my own jazz quintet and nearly all ours were, were head arrangements. And um, anyway, of course, I mean, I was just a sound engineer. I had nothing to do with the production at that time. So they got together and um, Pete had to go. So Ringo came into the group, so then we started doing Love Me Do again. This time with George Martin. I think Ron was in there as well at the same time. It was a double production job. And again, Ringo's drumming did not impress. And I was dying to say, it's not what they're playing, uh, how they're playing, it's what they're playing. But I thought, well, I better keep out of it, keep stum. And um, anyway, the next thing happened was that uh, Ringo was taken off and a session drummer was brought in, a session drummer called Andy White, who I knew very well. He didn't like it very much, no. but we, we didn't speak. And I parked him just saying hello, that sort of thing, and it was just, yeah, I think he, he, he talks about it still. <laughs>
things like that, what they wanted, because they'd been playing them for a while. You know, they had a routine for each number, so that's what, and we'd work on one until we had it, you know, more or less the way they wanted it, and then start doing takes. And when you finish that one, you go on to learn the next one <laughs> too. Andy had listened to uh, their head arrangement, and see, he started playing almost exactly how I thought it should be played, funnily enough. And I, I thought, that's how it should be done. And of course, that's how the master was achieved with uh, Andy White playing drums. Uh, for Love Me Do. Um, I mean, you can tell Andy White's version and Ringo's version of Love Me Do. Uh, Ringo's a little bit heavier. Um, my version was totally different. And I think the unfair thing about people who sort of listen to my version and sort of compare it with uh, Andy's version and Ringo's version is that mine wasn't a finished version. Right? That was dropped in a couple of tracks. And that was just dropped for the edification of letting George Martin and the sound engineers know what the song was about, okay? And, you know, to let them think about it. And of course, the next time they came back, you know, they'd have a better idea as regards what the arrangement was. So, you know, when you listen to it, I listen to it, and it's like, well, yeah, it's not a finished recording. You know, it's like a, a glorified demo. You know, that's one way of looking at it. Um, it, the song changed an awful lot when Andy took over and that was Jordy Martin's arrangement, you know, compared with the way that we as the Beatles, not me, okay, had performed Love Me Do to the audiences. You know, there was a change of beat that was slightly different, it was slower, and the change of beat was put in because that was fascinating to the audiences. Recording studios were places you didn't you, people just couldn't have book a recording studio and wander in in those days. You know, it, it, it had to be someone sensible in charge of these valuable equipment. I mean, the EMI was like a laboratory. It wasn't. It wasn't like these sort of do-it-yourself places they have nowadays. You know, people wore white coats and brown coats, and they and and they called each other sir and mister, and they wore ties and you know. It was a serious business, making records, so somebody had to be in charge on EMI's behalf, and it was George Martin. And he was brilliant, he sort of um, understood almost immediately what the Beatles were about. I don't think he quite understood originally, uh, right at the very beginning, but after a few attempts with them, he, he realised that you know, what they were and how talented they were as he could only compliment them. But the first sort of bona fide single was Love Me Do, which sort of crept into the sort of very edge of the top 20, largely because of the buzz from up north and scattered sort of spinnings on Radio Luxembourg. It was quite a while before I was able to get the national newspapers um, very interested. Uh, up here uh, in Liverpool, the record went straight to number one. Um, it was immediately bought in, in large quantities, but not quite large as large quantities as the local record uh, uh, the record uh, retailers. This story that Brian Epstein bought about 10,000 copies of the first single to buy it into the charts. Well, the, the truth of it is, one, uh, it went straight to number one in Liverpool on the truth of actual sales figures for the Merseyside area. I can promise you that. I was around at the time and I know it was. But two, Brian Epstein did burn his fingers because he had bought too many copies. But he was not alone. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that a number of retailers in Liverpool, not just NEMS bought extra large quantities expecting the Beatles to be huge sellers. They weren't, they were enough, uh, they sold enough to make it to number one in the, the area at the time, but they did not sell in the huge numbers that a lot of people locally uh, in the business had hoped and thought, simply because the kids in Liverpool wanted to keep their Beatles. And they figured that if the Beatles got too big, 
uh, and, and would be, uh, immediately leave Liverpool. That if the Beatles gained national and international popularity, they would be lost to, to Liverpool, and the Beatles would not come down to the Cavern Club anymore. After that, they went for the jugular with the "Please, please me." We did a, a take of "Please, please me," which I think was uh, released on the album, the first album. Although Ringo played on the single, which was the big hit of Please Please Me. Which was a much sort of more commercially viable um, prospect and that sort of almost but not quite made it to number one. It was blocked by a record by a singer called Frank Ifield. He was very much sort of in vogue at the time, but you know, within several months, I mean, he was you know, on the way out, he was, you know, he was, you know, in areas where sort of current hit parade status didn't matter. And the beat, and, you know, all sort of solo artists like him, Helen Shapiro, you know, were suddenly drowned in the riptide of Mersey beat. And the Beatles spearheaded that, or well, the Beatles and Jerry and the Pacemakers. Jerry, his first three records all went to number one. The Beatles had a number two, and then from then on, it was plain sailing. I mean, I think that the British public needed some a break from very serious news. There'd been a lot going on. There'd been the you know the the Profumo scandal, the Great Train robbery. That's the usual sort of East-West black-white tensions, and the West Indians. Indies had beaten us at cricket and what we wanted was something a bit sort of jovial you know something a bit safe and there it was. It was always fun because we were we were doing things and we were crossing boundaries and doing things that other bands weren't doing and it was always exciting it was always each day you look forward to it it wasn't like waking up and going oh god here we go what are we going to do today it was like let's wake up and let's get on with life that was that was it. That's why the time passed so fast. You know, it was so exciting. There were so many things going on, different directions. The Beatles proved that, you know, the group could be something, a self-contained entity without being a sort of somebody in the somebodies, like Cliff Richard and the Shadows. And everybody in the group could be a personality in its own right. Even the drummer skulking behind everybody else, you know, toiling behind his kit, could actually come across. And it reached the point where the thought of a Beatles without John, Paul, George or Ringo in it was unthinkable. Just you know, this buzzing of mass hysteria probably happens every 20 years or something, in some form or other, I don't know. But they, you know, they just captured it completely. Yeah. A big lie.